This is the video on classes and polymorphism, inheritance, and encapsulation. A class is a group of related properties and methods. And some purists would add that has state, for example, like a light switch. Properties is the object-oriented term for variables, and methods is the object-oriented term for procedures. So it's a group of related variables and procedures. But we must use the object-oriented uh, terms so that we talk the talk and we sound good in an interview and when dealing with other professionals. Now if we look at the evolution of data types, it started off with simple things like bytes and memory. Um, and the programmer was entirely responsible for everything. And then the simple data types evolved from that. Short and long floats double care as examples and others. Next obviously came things like uh, arrays where we had a group of variables all of the same data type. And that gave birth to things like strings, which is an array of characters. Then came structures, which is a group of variables of different data types. And that was used a lot for record processing and things like that. Now, I don't think these have all evolved uh, one after the other like that. They just sort of arrived on the scene, uh, probably all together. But uh, we can see a clear evolution if we break it up this way. Uh, and after you had arrays and structures, you started having different combinations like arrays of structures. And that would be for record processing for like files, reading a whole bunch of records out of a file and storing them into an array of structures. You know all about that from the homeworks in C1. And you can also, believe it or not, have structures with arrays inside them. So you can have a structure with a string or character array inside of it. So nothing too unusual. It's just those are the combination of tools that we need. Uh, finally, after all of that, came the class, which a class combines like or related variables and methods. And it's the obvious thing to do. So after introducing classes, we need to ask yourself, why do we as programmers want to use classes? Well, because humans tend to view the world in terms of objects. For example, if I ask someone if he has a car and he replies yes, I can make assumptions about that car. I can assume it has four wheels, a steering wheel, gas pedal, brake pedal, seat belts, etc., and so on. Classes, which are blueprints for objects, so let me say that again, classes, which are blueprints for objects, make it easier for programmers to model real-world processes in code. Ah, and that's a good thing, which is why we use them. Now, don't fall in love with the tool. Classes are great, but they are only one tool in your toolbox. They don't work in all situations, and you don't want to force everything into a class. Learning when to use classes and where is part of the challenge of becoming a senior programmer and or project lead. It takes time and it's not going to happen overnight. Now when you uh, try to understand what a class is, think of the variables or properties of a class as adjectives or nouns that describe an entity. So for, uh, and think of the methods as verbs that the entity can do. For example, what properties variables or adjectives might a dog have? Well, dog's got a name, it's got an age, it's got a weight, it has a breed, things like that. Now what methods or verbs might a dog have? What are the things that a dog can do? Well, a dog can bark, fetch, drool, and sh shed, amongst other things. Now if I ask you what properties and methods a checking account class might have, you'd probably say Hmm, think about that for a second. What are properties of a checking account? And what I do this example in class, I have everybody guess, and we all come up pretty much with the same ones. And what are things you can do with a checking account? Well, people come up with the same guesses. So some properties that a checking account might have would be a name for the checking account, the actual account number itself, a routing number, and most importantly, a balance. Now what are the things that you can do with a checking account? Well, you can make deposits, you can make withdrawals, or write a check, and you can check your balance. Now see, it's very intuitive. Most of you probably came up with similar answers, or the same answers, and if given a little more time, you probably would have had very close to the same thing. And that is why we use them. We look at the world in terms of objects, and we make certain assumptions about that, and if we can do that in code, it helps a whole lot. By saying, see checking account, all of you know intuitively what it does without having to list 
all of the details. Now we're going to talk about object-oriented languages and object-oriented programming. In order for a language to be considered object-oriented, it must support three qualities or properties. And those properties are polymorphism, inheritance, and encapsulation. And the acronym to remember that is PI. So if you're in an interview and they say, what properties uh, must a language support in order to be considered object-oriented? You can say, oh, it's PI, polymorphism, inheritance, encapsulation. And you need to burn those terms in. If you're asked those in an interview, there should be absolutely no pause in, in your answer to that question. If you have to think for a second or two, your score goes down and you don't do as well as in the interview. And I have been asked that question in an interview. So how does classes fit into this? Well, classes are the vehicle by which those properties are implemented in a language. So it's the vehicle or mechanism by which those things happen in a language. And I'll demonstrate each one of those in the video using classes. Now we need to learn those things because this whole class, C++, is about an object-oriented programming language and we need to learn each of those properties or qualities so that we can say that we are object-oriented programmers or at least have an understanding of object-oriented programming concepts and that we are ready to jump into the business world and use our knowledge and skills to help solve business problems and these things of polymorphism, inheritance, and especially encapsulation are great tools that can help us with a large variety of problems and make us lots of good money. Not that the money's everything, but it sure helps. So let's look at class definition syntax. We want to know how to define a class. Now the mechanics of it, there are two files that we have to deal with. The first is a header file with a .h extension for header, and that contains a class declaration. Remember, a declaration. And that's like a, doing a prototype in C, except instead of for one uh, procedure, it's for the entire class. The other file, the second of the two, is the source file, the .cpp, and that contains all the class method definitions. So the definitions for all the class methods. Now, on the left side over here, I've got my header file, and on the right side, I've got my source file. Now we get some uh, window dressing that we have to use. First we have pound pragma once. Now what that does is that is a precompiler directive because it has the pound sign and it tells the compiler even if this file is included multiple times in our code, make sure the actual code is physically in our project only once. So even if there are multiple references, there is only one copy and that's really important you'll see why we need to do that next you start off with the keyword class and then you put the class name of whatever you want that's placeholders and then you have open curly bracket and close curly bracket just like a procedure or a for loop that defines the beginning and the ending of the class body actually the class declaration body and everything inside is what makes up the class now this is really 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 important at the very end of the class header you need a closing semicolon uh, you don't really have to do that for anything else to my knowledge I don't think you have to do that for procedures you don't have to do that for the bodies of for loops but if you forget it in C++ it's a big deal depending on the compiler now when I first started with Visual Studio I don't know what it was it was just Visual Studio uh, .NET which was around 2000, 2001, the error message that you got for a missing semicolon was extremely cryptic and hard to figure out and it would take a half, about a half an hour. They have since changed the error message the compiler gives and it's all nice and friendly now and it says you're missing a semicolon and even if you double click on the error message it even takes you to the line and tells you that you're missing it. But other compilers may not be as forgiving. Now inside the class declaration body, you typically have your properties first and then your method declarations second. So you put all your properties and you put the data type and then the variable name and then a semicolon. You cannot initialize at this point. 
Um, I'll explain more about that later, uh, maybe not all this week, but next week when we get into constructors. But you can't initialize here. You can't initialize here. You cannot initialize here. Go ahead and try it, and it will give you a compiler error. And then you have your method declarations. For example, void procedure 1, void procedure 2. Now remember, those are declar declarations. Those are like your prototypes. You don't actually write any code for those. So that is the header file. Then in your source file, which includes your method definitions, you include whatever your class is .h. Now you can have multiple includes, and you can put them in the source file, but it's uh, good etiquette to put all the includes that you need in your header file, and then in your source file you include just the header file. Now for each uh, procedure you have to have uh, the declaration like you're expecting, but you also have class name, colon, colon, and then the procedure and then you list them. They should be in the order that they are declared. Now what's the class name colon colon? We'll get to that shortly. But that is the generic syntax for defining a class in C++. Now let's look at a class definition example using the syntax that we just covered. Here's the actual code for a dog class. First off you want to name the header file, the class name, but with a dot h. You're going to have your pound pragma once, and then you're going to have class C dog. Two properties of that a dog class might have would be a name and a weight. Remember, you can't initialize them there. And two things that a dog might be able to do, verbs, are bark and fetch. So remember, properties are like adjectives and met or, or uh, things that a, a, a uh, the entity might have, and methods are like verbs, and that's what entities can do. On the right side, we include uh, the header file that we just created. Now, notice the double quotes around the include. You use the angle brackets, the greater than or less than side, for system includes. Those are for files that are pre-built that are uh, in the system directory where it's installed, uh, or Visual Studio is installed. However, if you want to include a file that you create, using the double quote says, hey, this is something we've created, uh, and the compiler knows to look in the project itself, not anywhere else. Then we have void c dog, that's the class name, colon colon bark, and in, in our bark method we have for something really cheesy like c out woof woof. And in fetch, we have something like C out fetching the stick. Uh, we would, of course, have to have an include IO stream, and we'd also have to use the standard namespace, like I showed in the uh, review videos, or in the review videos for homework one, I believe it was, something like that. But, anyways, we need those, but they're just, they would distract from that for the, uh, for the example. Now, what's this colon colon thing? that we use right here and right here. That is what's called the scope operator. And when defining a class method, it is used to tell the compiler that a particular method belongs to a particular class. So when we define the method, we're saying this fetch method belongs to this C dog class. Now some of you are going to accidentally leave that out and you're going to compile and it's going to say fetch method undefined or whatever and it's going to take you a good 15-20 minutes to figure that out. Uh, hopefully you get burned by that once and have just one scar. Sometimes you do it twice. But that is part of object oriented programming or that we have to learn. It's part of the mechanics. When defining your class methods you must always prefix the method name with the class name and the scope operator to formally define that method for that class. Uh, it is possible, by the way, to have multiple class definitions. So you can define several class, uh, classes inside one set of files. So you could have a C dog, C cat, C cow, whatever and put them all in one file called like animal.h or animals.h and animals.cpp. I strongly recommend against that. Divide and conquer, one file per class, and also that helps to illustrate um, why you need to prefix the procedure name or method name with a class name because two different classes could have the same method name 
and you have to distinguish which method goes with which class when you're defining it. Um, I think I said, uh, yeah, notice the double quotes around the file instead of the angle brackets. So what's new here syntax-wise is we have the double quotes for our include and the class name and the scope operator. So not a whole lot of new syntax, uh, but something that you need to burn in for your memory and you can never ever forget. When you write the class declaration in the header file and the class method definitions in the source file, you are defining how the class behaves. In, a set, in essence, you are defining a custom data type. And that bears repeating. You're defining a custom data type. Before you can use that new custom data type, you must make what's called an instance. An instance is an object-oriented programming term that can be defined as, are you ready, a specific occurrence in memory of an object built using a class blueprint. An example I like to use is the blueprint for a house. Blueprints are those diagrams drawn on blue paper, hence blueprint, that are created by architects that construction companies use as plans to build a house. A class is the same thing. The header and source files are plans used by the compiler to construct a custom data type in memory. Just like many houses can be built from a single blueprint, so can many instances be built from a single class. And I go on a little bit more. You cannot park a car in a blueprint. You cannot wallpaper a blueprint. You actually have to build a house from the blueprint, and then once you go inside, you can put any carpet or wallpaper that you want. So an, a class, when you define a class, you can't put any data in it. That's why you can't initialize the variables or the properties when you def, uh, declare them. However, after you make an instance, you can put data inside. Oh, so before you can go inside your class, you got to uh, make an instance from the blueprint. And then you can put anything in it that you want. After the class is defined, you make an instance using the same syntax you would for declaring any other variable. Now the generic syntax is the class name, space, and then class instance name followed by a semicolon. A specific example of that would be cdog, which is the class we defined, and then lowercase cls, which is the prefix for an instance. So when you make the blueprint, the prefix is capital C, and when you make an instance, the uh, pr a prefix is lowercase cls, and of course we use Buster, because Buster's a great dog, he lives in my neighborhood, he's a basset hound. Uh, so if you're lucky when you're walking by, he'll bark at you. So he's a great dog. Now that is just like declaring any other variable. You have the data type and then the variable name. So we have our class name and then our class name instance. After you've created an instance, you use the dot syntax like you do for structures to access, access the cl class properties. So for example, we make our instance and then we say clsbuster.sngweight equals 40. Now weight was one of the properties that we defined in the declaration. String copy CLS dot or CLS buster dot str name. Remember the assignment operator doesn't work yet with uh, strings in C, but we're going to learn how to fix that, and we can copy into that property of the class the string literal buster. We access the class methods using the exact same syntax. If you have the uh, class instance, you do dot uh, bark and dot fetch. Notice the parentheses that tell us that it's procedures as opposed to properties. And now Visual Studio is really nice. When you put the dot, a lot of times you'll get an autocomplete list of everything that's in the class. And so you can just select from a list and hit enter. And it's very, very convenient. So let me show you an actual example. I'm using Visual Studio. I'm not using my virtualized window, so or Visual Studio 2010. I didn't want to use the virtualized window for uh, 2012, so it may look slightly different, but I think you can figure it out. We've got three files in the homework. We've got our header file for the dog class, a source file for the dog class, and then a class with main in it that actually uses it. 
So I start off with my standard template. Uh, I have precompiler directive to include the file only once, even if referenced multiple, multiple times. I have the includes that I need for this class, and I'm also my namespace. So I have my keyword class, and then cdog. I want you to ignore the public keyword for the moment. Then I've got my properties and methods. So I have name and weight, and at the very end, my closing semicolon. In my dog file, my source, uh, or yeah, my source file, I include only cdog.h. All other includes, as I said, should be in the header file. And then I have my class method definitions. So my bark and fetch. So that is the source file where I have the class method definitions. So remember, header file, declaration, source file, class method definitions. And then finally, we switch to our main homework file, and I make an instance, and I copy in name and weight to my instance after I create it, and then I call bark and fetch. And let's see if we can get the autocomplete to work for us. Nope, no trouble sense, or uh, IntelliSense. I wonder why it's doing it. Maybe it needs to be built. Nope, it's not working out for me. So I'll go ahead and build that. And it succeeded. And then I'll go ahead and run it. Let me drag that window in there. And it says, woof woof, fetching the tasty stick, which is exactly what we coded it to do. Centralized business logic. One of the benefits of making and using classes is centralized business logic. Let's look at the CDOG bark method. We could easily modify the code to produce different results based on the weight of the dog for each particular instance. So for example, I can put an if statement in there and if the dog is less than 15 pounds then it should print yip 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 for a little ankle biter uh, when the bark method is called. Otherwise if it's 15 pounds or more it uh, prints out woof woof. Now I know that example seems trivial uh, for the moment. Trust me, it'll get much more complicated very shortly. But at this point, I want you to focus on the mechanics and the syntax rather than any fancy logic. Now we can make two different instances, one for Buster and one for Fifi. And just like you can build two houses from the same blueprint, so our, in this case, our blueprint is CDOG, and we build two houses, and they're right next to each other. Inside one, we can put blue carpet, and in the other, we can put uh, great 70s shag green carpet. So two different instances, both have a different set of unique values inside. So with Buster, it's got a way to 40, and with Fifi, it's got a way to 10 when we call the bark method for the buster instance it's going to print woof 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 and when we call the bark method for Fifi it's going to print yip 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 now that is really pretty cool now it may not seem like a big deal now but very soon it will because that's when your knowledge of C++ grows and you'll realize just the awesome coolness of what things like that allow you to do in code at this point, a class looks a lot like a structure, but with methods. If you've had any .NET experience, this introduction to classes may seem a little underwhelming. Let's change that. Suppose we have a CDOG instance, and we'll use, of course, Buster again, and we go to set the weight. For whatever reason, there's a mistake in the calculation, and the weight is accidentally set to a negative value. Now, how can that happen? Well, remember back when, when you were doing uh, structure stress and part pane and you were reading values in from a file and you were programmatically pulling values out of the middle, so you're doing substrings, you're trying to get the next field, and your indexes were off by a little bit, um, and you were either getting too much or too little, things like that, or you'd go off the end of your arrays. Well, the exact same thing can happen, but when you're setting properties. So, here we set the weight to Buster accidentally to negative 40. Oh no, our dog has floated away. Now that could be really, really bad. I, I don't even want to contemplate uh, dogs floating around in the air. Now that may seem like a joke to you, but it can happen. 
negative values or wrong values in code happen all the time. So let me give you an example that will bring it home. Let's suppose we had a C book class and it's used by Amazon or some other seller like that online. And it has a S and G price property. Yeah, you can see where I'm going with this. Somewhere, somehow, a programmer accidentally set the price to a negative value. So for example, you have an instance CLS SQL Server for programmers and the price on that is instead of being positive thirty dollars it's negative well what would happen somebody out there either unscrupulous or um, whatever malicious would instantly buy all the copies because this would uh, because his account would be credited with money instead of debited so for each copy that he purchased instead of subtracting thirty dollars from his account it would add um, and it would probably be a PayPal account and as soon as the order was processed he would shut he would shut the uh, PayPal account down and withdraw his funds uh, and it would be really hard to track down that sort of thing can and will happen but we don't want that sort of thing to happen in our code ever that's really bad this is where centralized business logic comes to the rescue we can add a set weight method to our CDOG class or a set price method to our CBOOK class and in that method we can do what's called boundary checking and we can check that the new value is within those bounds so for example in my uh, method definition for my dog class now remember the class you have to prefix the method name with the class name and the scope operator so I've set weight and it takes a single parameter S and G new weight now in there if that weight is less than zero I can clip it to zero. Now you could do all kinds of error processing if you want. Um, you could write something to disk, you could send an email, uh, whatever. The important thing is is that you have centralized business logic by make, creating the set weight method and in there you can do boundary checking which is implemented using some sort of condition. Now um, in this particular example all we're doing is clipping. So if it's a negative value we're going to set it to the very minimum to a zero value and then we assign that new weight to our class level property now that is so cool we will never ever have a negative weight for our dog if the programmer always uses the set weight method instead of accessing the class weight properly directly that's pretty dang cool problem is that our autocomplete box is going to show both the set weight method and the SNG weight property it's guaranteed that some programmers will call the method and some will access the property and that's not what we want that's bad what we need is a way to force the programmers to use only the set weight method the designers of C++ thought of this knew it would be a problem and made a very elegant solution the solution is access modifiers access modifiers limit interactions with class properties and methods there are three levels of access modifiers. There's public, protected, and private. If you use .NET at all, you are probably already familiar with the, some of these. Now, the access modifiers can be defined as public. It can be accessed from anywhere in the project. So if you have a public property or a public method, it can be called or modified from anywhere in the project. Protected can be accessed only from the class in which it was declared and by classes that inherit. And finally, private can be accessed only from the class in which it was declared. Now you'll need to memorize those and burn them in. I like to use the following analogies to describe how they work. Public is like the doorbell on your house. Anyone can walk up and ring it. It's public. Protected is like your refrigerator. Only your family members can open it and get take food out and put food in and private is like your wallet only you can take money out or put money in here are some access modifier guidelines in general you should never have public properties notice public properties why because if they can be changed anytime and anywhere they will be and that's an absolute nightmare if not an impossibility to debug in a, in a large application 
Now, global variables are like sharing a laundry basket, hamper, washer, and dryer with several other people. Uh, so the example I like to give is let's say you live in an apartment all by yourself and you have one dresser, one laundry basket, one hamper, and one washer and dryer. The laundry always comes out nice. However, if you share a house or an apartment with three or four other people and you have only one hamper, one laundry basket, one washer, and one dryer, and one of the other people that's in the house is a neat freak, and at least two others are complete slobs. Some are members of the same sex and some are members of the opposite sex. What are the clothes going to look like when they come out? They are going to be an absolute mess <laughs> or a pink mess because somebody put colors in with all the whites. <laughs> all right. So if you can imagine what it would be like sharing laundry baskets uh, or laundry facilities with a bunch of slobs, that's what's going to happen on a project with what are called global variables or public properties. That's why you never ever want to use them. Um, so how do you fix that? Well, you uh, well I'm going to show you. All right. Now you can have all the public constants and methods that you want. Now you want to try to default your constants and methods to either protected or private and make public only if you have to. It helps make cleaner interfaces, and that's what's seen in the autocomplete box for IntelliSense. You don't have to do that. You could make everything public, and it's, it would still be okay. But most of the time, um, you you want to make them protected or private, and uh, but making the public is not a big deal. You should never have public properties. So we take our knowledge of access modifiers, and we go back to our C dog weight property, and we make it private, and that's going to restrict access to only procedures in the class itself. So if you recall the definition for private, it limits access to uh, the class in which it was declared. So that means only methods declared in that class can access that property. Now if a programmer tries to access the weight property outside of the class, he will get an error. Danger is, what if we want to read the value? Well, the compiler won't ac let us access the private property. No. Oh. Well, what's the solution? Uh, simple. We just make everything public and forget about it. <laughs> Not. What we need to do is make a get method. So, for example, c dog colon colon get weight, and then we return s and g weight. And I will now demo that to you in Visual Studio. Here I am in Visual Studio, back to my header file for my dog class, and I've got my access modifier for my properties, which is private, and my access modifier for my methods, which is public. Now when you put in an access modifier, it is applied by the compiler to everything from there on down until the end of the file or until it hits another access modifier. So now this would be really bad and I don't recommend it, but you could make name public and the weight private and then you would have your public methods again. I recommend against that. Make sure all your properties are either protected or private. And most of the time with your methods they will be public. Now I've added in a public set weight and a public get weight. We'll flip over to our uh, source file where we have our method definitions and I have defined those. Notice they are defined in the order that they were declared. So we pass in the new weight and if that new weight is less than zero we clip it to zero uh, or let's put negative, That's which should be the real comment and then we can assign it to our class variable and we have our get weight function that just returns it. Then we go to our class now let's see what happens if I try to access the property directly. I will go ahead and build the solution and I get S and G wait cannot access private member declared C dog and the reason for this is this is a separate file and it is not part of C dog to be part of C dog I'd have to put the dog prefix uh, class prefix in front of it with a scope operator and I would have to have a main a void main function declared in the header file since I'm not doing that this is not part of the class and therefore I cannot programmatically access 
a private variable or property or method. So I have to comment that out and I'm forced to use the set weight method. And then if I want to read it, I have to go through the get weight method. So let's go ahead and build the solution. And it worked. I can go ahead and run it. And there we go. We see that the weight is zero even though I set it to negative 40. Now that is pretty awesome. Guaranteed never to have a negative weight and it's enforced programmatically. So I kind of think of that as like a foreign key on, uh, on, a, on a table. You'll never have a invalid value and that is great in terms of tech support calls that we won't have. Now believe it or not, you've just learned one third of object-oriented programming. Oh, that's so cool. You've learned encapsulation. In my experience, this by far is the most valuable of the three properties that object-oriented programming languages have to offer. It has saved me so much pain and suffering in tech support calls that I didn't have to answer. So let's give you a formal definition of encapsulation. Encapsulation is hiding the inner workings of a class. Next question programmers have is, well, how do you do that? It's a two-part answer. First, make all, not some, or a lot, or most, but all properties protected or private. And two, make public get set methods for each property. Now, why do you want to do that? Well, the first, boundary checking. You can make sure that you never have a negative weight or a negative price. That's pretty cool. Second, you have centralized business logic. That means instead of having the same code in several spots throughout your program, you put it in just one location. For example, the logic for a dog saying yip, 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 or woof, woof, woof. Later on, when you get to the capstone, I will be able to give you an example of object-oriented programming that uses classes and encapsulation that will make your life so much easier you will so love the centralized business logic because of the problems that it solves for you. And finally, it's easier to debug, and I'll demo that in Visual Studio in here in a second. So those are all three very good reasons to use encapsulation. Now, I won't deny that it is a fair amount of work. You have to make all those variables private, and you have to make get set methods for each and every one. However, the payoff is usually in the uh, uh, text support phone calls you don't have to answer. So let me demonstrate how encapsulation makes debugging easier. Are you ready? Bam! There you go. This is the only spot in the entire program that SNG weight should be changing. <laughs> if you're getting strange values, what you can do is you can put an if statement or a breakpoint right here in this if statement and then pause your program when that happens and step through the logic and trace back where that value is coming from and then why. Um, so that is a huge lifesaver and that's why we love as programmers encapsulation. As I stated it does work uh, making the get sets but you get that back in all the tech support calls you don't have to answer and I can certainly testify to that. It saved my life at my, my last job. Now remember, each bug can potentially generate one tech support call per customer, for each customer. So bugs are non-trivial. Now it's in the school environment, if you have a bug in your code, you may lose a few points. At the absolute worst, you may fail a class. Uh, that would rarely happen. So there's this kind of blasé attitude towards bugs. Oh, I'll fix it. Well, when bugs cause technical support phone calls and cause problems for customers and you need to fix them right away they go from being trivial to very very dangerous and so we need to start changing our mindset that bugs are serious things and they will cause us and other people lots of problems unless we're very proactive and so that is why I use encapsulation uh, consistently all the time at this point, students want to start using classes. And here are some guidelines for making and using structures and classes. A structure, which is a group of related variables, no methods, is like a suitcase. I use them when I go traveling. When do I travel? When I pass three or more variables from one procedure to another. So for example, if you've had me for .NET 2 or Java, you know about add player to database. 
Uh, that's where I pull all the values off the screen, stuff them in a suitcase, and then call database utilities. Now, if I'm not manipulating the data, or if I'm not processing it, or um, uh, preserving the data in local memory, uh, how would I be preserving the data? Well, let's say I have to read it into a file, in from a file, and clean it up, and then put it in a database. Um, if I'm if I'm not doing any of that stuff, then I don't need to go to the extra trouble of classizing the data and adding the get set methods. I just need a simple suitcase. And so there are times when it's okay to use a structure. And with the add player to database example, I'm just carrying the data from a form to a module. Uh, not a big deal. However, as soon as I start adding code to my project that processes the data, so for example, let's say I was calculate the retail cost for an item. Now notice the item is a structure, user defined type. Uh, as soon as I do that, well, then I need to start uh, to consider to turn the structure into a class and get all the centralized business logic, the boundary checking, and the ease of debugging that goes along with that. So if I'm just passing the data around, no need to classize it. But if I'm starting to manipulate it or process it, then yes, I do want to classize it. I want to talk to you about class property prefixes. Let's revisit the get weight method again. Now in here, I'm returning S and G weight. That's a little confusing because we're returning a variable, but it hasn't been declared anywhere in the procedure. What we want to do is indicate to the programmer that it's not a local variable, but a class level property. To do that, we prefix some, most, many, no, all, all class level properties with an M underscore. For example, we uh, have our CDOG class, str name becomes M underscore str name, and SNG weight becomes M underscore SNG weight. Now the get weight method looks like this return m underscore sng weight. The m underscore, which means member of the class, makes it clear that we are dealing with a class level property and a not a local variable. And then I'm no longer confused as a program as to where this variable magically came from. By the way, in .NET, I often use f underscore for form level variables instead of m underscore, even though it's still a class. Uh, f underscore kind of makes a little bit more sense to me. You could use either f underscore or m underscore for forms uh, in .NET, but probably m underscore is the best. Now, where did m underscore came, come from? That's just tradition in object-oriented programming. It means member of, um, and that's why you use it. Now I'm going to show you a template that I want you to use as a starting point for all classes that you create in this course. I'll post it on Blackboard so you can copy and paste from it. So I switch to Visual Studio. You're going to start off with a, a standard comment block that's got an abstract in it and you're going to tell me a brief description of what the class does. I will take off points if you lose, leave the dot dot dot. Remember you want to be terse. Uh, your description is half a line to a line. If you write too much, uh, other programmers won't read it uh, because you're diluting the value of your word. We're going to do pound pragma once. Now I have this long comment because uh, as starting off you need to know what that means, but eventually you can, uh, uh, well, just go ahead and leave it in. You've got your includes, then your class name, always begin the class blueprint with a capital C, instances are lowercase cls. You will always have your properties first, and you'll have a nice little comment block that sets those off. You'll leave in public protected and private, but with comments to never make public properties, make protected with public get set methods. That's so you're uh, leaving a trail of breadcrumbs. You've got a structure for other people to follow. Uh, you'll have any properties that you want. Always prefix with the M underscore. Then you'll have your methods. Typically you have your, uh, again we have the public, protected, and private. Um, typically you'll have your property get set methods first, or set get. And by the way, don't have a whole bunch of sets and then a whole bunch of gets. That's not what you want. The reason for that is you want them paired with a set and get because when you're writing and debugging, you're probably looking at one property at a time. So you don't want to be bouncing up and down in the code. You want them one right after the other. And they should be in the order that you declared them up top of the properties. And then you'll have any other class methods like your do something. And don't forget your trailing semicolon. We can look at the source file. This is where you have class method definitions for whatever class it is. If you want more details, you should go to the header file. 
you have your single include for your class name and you should have your definitions, method definitions, in the same order that they were declared. And so that is the template that I want you to use and that I will post on Blackboard that you can copy and paste. Then now would be a good time to take a break if you need one. Next, I'd like to talk to you about inheritance. Inheritance is reusing or including all the code from another class, and this is the critical part, without having to retype it. Now remember, you can't use a word or phrase to describe itself, so you can't say inheritance is where a class inherits code from another class. <laughs> you are including or reusing all the code from another class without retyping it. Inheritance is the second most useful property of object-oriented programming, at least in my experience. I haven't used it that often, but when I do, it's very convenient. Now, there are ways to get by without it, and you can do what's called interface inheritance. So it's not a must-have, but it is nice. I have to introduce a few object-oriented programming terms before I can show you the syntax for inheritance. The existing class that gets included or inherited is often called the parent class. The new class that builds upon or uses the existing class is often called the child class. So for example, the C dog class, the parent class, could be inherited by the C trained dog class, and that's the child dog class, or the child class. The trained dog class can do everything that the C dog class can do and more, as you would expect. The parent and child classes can also be referred to as the base and derived classes, respectively, and the superclass and subclasses. Super for a superset, subclass for a subset. Um, though that's just what it's called. The syntax for inheritance is very easy. It's all done in the header file of the child class. First, you have to include the base class header file. Notice the double quotes. All right, so that's the parent class or base class and the uh, double quotes tell us that it's a file that we created and it's not one that's built in although you could have used one that's built in second after the class name so whatever your class name your child is uh, and before the uh, opening curly bracket for the declaration you need a colon and then an access modifier followed by the parent class that you plan to inherit now, as far as access modifier goes, I have only ever used public. I'm sure there are some reasons uh, to use, or some scenarios where you want to use protected or private, but most of the time you'll probably use public. Inheritance example. Let's look at an example with a C dog class as the parent class and C train dog as the child class. The C train dog class can do everything that the C dog class can do and more. So notice I include C dog because I need to tell the compiler to, what to expect. And then after my C our class for C trained dog declaration, I put public, I put colon, and then public C dog. And when I do that, I automatically get the name and the weight, the get set methods for the name and the weight, and bark and fetch. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to extend that and I'm going to add in a, a function or method called play dead. And so a trained dog, you can uh, train them to play dead, and you could add anything else extra in you want in there but you don't have to redefine what you included and that is pretty cool. Congratulations, you now know two-thirds of object-oriented programming. Isn't that cool? Inheritance is a lot easier compared to encapsulation. It's very easy to implement. Uh, it's very easy to code. Uh, sadly, you don't use it that very often. Uh, don't fall in love with the tool and try to force it in situations where you don't need it just because you know how to use it. Uh, if you do come up with a good example of inheritance that's used in business, I would love to hear about it. Uh, send me an email or give me a call, and I'll buy that coffee, and we can talk tech. Moving on to the last quality of an object-oriented language, that's polymorphism. Polymorphism is the ability to treat different instances the same way because they both or they all share a common inherited ancestor class. You probably won't use polymorphism much unless you're doing Windows programming or something similar. It's cool and it's interesting, but it's just not that common. Now we're going to need to learn one new keyword or term that's almost always used with inheritance, and that term is a virtual. The virtual keyword is applied to one or more parent class method declarations, 
in the header file. So it's applied to one or more parent class method declarations in the header file. It allows any child classes to redefine the virtual parent method. Otherwise, the child classes cannot change or overwrite the parent class method. So when a child class inherits all the code from a parent class, it is stuck with those methods. It can't change them unless one or more methods has the virtual keyword applied to it. And then optionally, that method can be redefined in the child class if desired. Now, there are reason, programmatic reasons for doing um, everything in the spectrum. You might want that none of the methods of the parent can be redefined. You might want some of them to be redefined. Or, very, very rarely, you make them all virtual and they must all be defined. Very rare, but sometimes it does happen. Let me show you an example to help illustrate the concept. Suppose we have a C animal parent class that has the following properties and methods. So you've got a name, an animal type, and then get and sets for name and type, and a virtual make noise function. Now, this is the shorthand for describing a class. Sometimes there's a box around it, sometimes they don't put the data types, but typically it's the class name, then the properties, and then some sort of divider, and then the methods. Now the make noise method will be redefined by each class that inherits because it is virtual. Now suppose there are several types of child classes that inherit the C animal parent class. For example, we have cow, dragon, moose, and wombat, and they all inherit C animal. Now let's say we want to make a zoo. We could do that by making an array of C animal pointer type and populating it with instance of classes that inherit C animal. So for example, I make a dog instance and I set the name and the type and the weight. And then I have a cow instance and I set the name and the type. And then I have a dragon instance and I set the name and the type. Next I make a array, size 5, of pointers to instances of C animal. And then I populate my array. Now, by the way, because it's of type animal, I have to do what's called an explicit cast. Now, in C1, you learned about those. So we do an explicit cast. We get the address of the instance, and then we cast it from a dog class pointer to a C animal class pointer, and then we put that in an array. I put the second spot as 0. I do the same thing with cow. Uh, for, uh, third spot is zero, and finally the last spot I make the uh, dragon. After populating the array, we can loop through, and for each non-null value in the zoo, we can call any method from the animal parent class. So for example, I'm going to do a loop, and zero will less than five, and if the particular item in the zoo is not empty, so if our cage is not empty, then what I can do is I can call any method or access any property, but because all my properties are, are never public, that, that wouldn't make sense. So I can call any method in the C animal parent class. For example, I can get the name, I can get the type, and here's the cool part, I can call the make noise method. And because it was virtual, if we redefined that method for each animal, then it will print a different noise each time out. Wow, that is pretty awesome. So let me go ahead and demo that for you in Visual Studio. So here I'm in Visual Studio. Now notice in the Solution Explorer you've got a header files folder and a source files folder. It's common practice to put all your header files in the header files folder and keep all your source folders down here. Uh, and how do you get one from the other? It's simple. You just drag it, move it around, very easy. We'll start off with an animal class. It's just got a name and a type, which are both strings. I have set name and get name and set type and get noise or get type and a virtual void make noise. Very straightforward class. The implementation on that, uh, when I set the name, I make sure that it doesn't exceed the amount of space that I've allocated. Probably would be better to use a constant for that, but there's a little landmine in declaring constants in a class and <laughs> I'm not going to show you how to do that. I'm going to let you stumble upon that. 
I do the same thing for set type. And finally, make noise is undefined. I just see out. Then in each of my child classes or derived classes, I inherit that. I add a unique property, for example, weight, and I redefine the make noise. Now I have to define the set and get weight because that is not in the animal. And I want to redefine my make noise because I don't want the default uh, uh, functionality inherited from the parent class. Probably going to have something like moo. I'm going to use virtual so that if my cow class gets inherited, say I have C super cow, <laughs> and what's a super cow do? Well, it dispenses from its udder both regular milk and chocolate milk, and ooh, maybe even strawberry milk. Um, and something that a that is unique to a cow is that it will graze. And we will look at the source file for that. And notice I include only the cow header file. So we set the weight and we make sure our cow is not negative. Don't want any floating cows. We redefine our make noise. Uh, notice the keyword virtual is not in the definition, only in the declaration. We have moo. And what does the cow do when, when it's grazing? Mm, it's, that's some tasty grass. Mm. And then we do you know, the same sort of thing for a dragon. Uh, it also has weight. You probably have amount of gold, something like that, instead of weight. Uh, it has a unique function, uh, breathe fire. And its noise is a roar, and it, it definitely breathes fire. So those are my different classes. Now we go to the main file, where I'm going to use those. And first off, I have to include them all if I plan on using them. And here's the simple example with Buster and Make Noise. So let me go ahead and run that for you. Or not. Well, it's slow. Here it comes. Okay. So, woof woof fetching the tasty stick. And the reason it did woof woof is because Buster, if we look in the implementation for that, the definition. When he makes noise, he is over 15 pounds, so he definitely does woof woof. And we go back to our main function in our class example file. We scroll down, and what you can see is I've made an instance of Daisy, or cow, and populated it, an instance of dragon. Then I go ahead and I make my zoo, and I populate it with my instances and then I loop through and this right here is the polymorphism. Even though they are different types of classes, they all share a common ancestor, the C animal parent class, and because of that I can call any method in that parent class that I want. Now notice because it's a pointer, instead of using the dot, I use the arrow syntax. and then we call the make noise. Now this is the truly spectacular part. We're going to get a different noise for each animal instance. So we rerun the program and there's part one with a dog and fetching the tasty stick, tasty stick and now here's the cool part. We get name buster, type dog, and the noise that it makes is woof woof. Ooh -hoo -hoo. The next one is Daisy and it's a type cow and it goes moo and then the third one is smog type dragon and he goes roar. Wow! That right there is polymorphism. Pretty cool stuff. Now it's common in Windows programming to call the get type method which is almost always part of the parent class. Uh, another common one is to string which if you've done any .NET programming you realize that pretty much every object has the to string method. Uh, they've also, believe it or not, got the get type. You just haven't called it yet. And then you explicitly cast the instance from the generic parent class type into the specific child class type. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, so you can access the specific child class methods. So let me demo that to you. So I'm back in Visual Studio, and I'm just continuing on with the previous project. I've got Buster, Daisy, and Smog and then we had the first polymorphism example and now we're going to do the second polymorphism example. 
I'm still looping through and if I get a non null value then I can call any animal parent class method or property now that's that's pretty cool but here's the child specific uh, child class specific example where we do the explicit cast back to the child class so I string compare the type of animal with dog and if that's equal to zero that means they're the same then what I do is I take that pointer I cast it use an explicit cast to a C dog pointer and then once it's there then I can call the fetch method which is particular to just dogs and then I do the exact same thing with cow and with dragon now why oh why oh why would you want to do that well I'll give you a bit of a hint in net there is a controls property so if you have an index that goes from 0 to me which is the current form dot controls dot items dot count minus one that would be a loop that would allow you to loop through every control on the form so loop through all controls on a form now why would you want to do that well you could get the current control so CLS or we'll do CTL for the current control is equal to me dot controls dot items sub int index so you get the current control and if let's say the current control dot get type now it's not this exact syntax but it's close enough if that equals a text box ooh. Now, if it's a text box, why would that be a big deal to you? Hmm. Well, because if it's a text box, then you can, current text box, you can cast. Now, VB does an implicit cast, so you don't have to do it explicitly. You can cast that into a text box, assuming that you dimensioned dim txt current text box as a text box and of course your current control would be as a control alright now once it's in a text box what does that allow you to do well that allows you to access the text property now why would you want to do that so you could trim the text box Ooh, and that would be a quick little procedure in .NET that would show you the benefits of number one encapsulation because you don't have access to that property directly you you are given that it returns okay second off there is inheritance every type of control text boxes combo boxes list boxes radio buttons all inherit from a regular control and what that does is it allows them to have an array of controls that you can access and then through polymorphism you can call get type on all of those and if it's a particular type that you're interested say a text box you can do an explicit or implicit cast into the child specific class type that you want so that you can access child specific properties or methods oops and this should be text here uh, text so you get the text out of it, you trim it, and then you sign it back. And that, as we know, is trim all form text boxes. Ooh, isn't that cool? Why, yes, it is. And if you've had me for .NET 2 or .NET 3 or C3, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, by the way, there's also something similar in Java. So if you're taking my Java class, you will be doing something similar. So there is definitely use for this most of the time we don't create it we just use what's existing but that is why we would want to do something like that isn't that cool so what we do is we loop through and if it's something that we want then we call the child class specific method how about we go ahead and demonstrate that so I'll run the program and we get step one with just woof woof and tasty stick with C dog class then we do our first example of polymorphism 
and then we do our second example where we get the name, the type, and we make the noise, but then we ch call the child specific class method, fetching the tasty stick, moo or graze, and breathe fire. Wow, that is some pretty cool stuff. Now even better, you're going to get to do something like that in this course later in the semester. And let me tell you, it's going to be cool and you're going to enjoy it. That's going to be pretty wild. In summary, you have learned all the syntax and mechanics of polymorphism, inheritance, encapsulation. You may feel dizzy and nauseous, but that's completely normal. <laughs> all right. You're probably going to have to look over this material several times. You're going to have to read what's in the book several times to make sense of it. It takes a while for the seeds of knowledge to grow and sprout. It's rare that someone just gets object-oriented programming from the start. It's usually an evolution. It's something you have to work towards. And that's only if you have a solid understanding of regular non-object-oriented programming techniques to begin with. Now give yourself a few weeks or several weeks to learn this. Uh, most of my students uh, feel that, say that they feel that they have to fight it the entire way through the semester. But at the end, they are much stronger programmers for it. Now, I'll help your learning by giving you lots and lots of homework assignments. <laughs> so that's the end of the, uh, the video.